Copyright waffle. Copyright waffle. Copyright waffle. All right. Hey. Okay. Right. Why did we do that? <laughs> we did that because this isn't like on the one last thing or the since we last met, but you do actually have. Um, this is your new guitar. Can it we is. can we show off? And you Yay. need to hold it. You okay. need to hold it because okay. it is your it's new guitar. guitar. Yay! <laughs> and I can play how many chords now? Six. You can play six chords. Yeah. Yeah. Six and chords. it takes you about ten seconds to change between each one. It does. But yes. practice makes perfect. Exactly. Right. Okay. Can we we, well, we must now? get on. Yeah. We, we must. have lots to get on with and some excellent guests. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. And hello, Charles. Thanks for joining. Hello. Me. Hello there. Hello. Good to see you. Okay, should we get our slides <laughs> back up then, and then we can... Here we go. Um, yes. Okay. So this... Yeah, we should introduce ourselves, shouldn't we? Just this is Webinar sure. 70. I'm Webinar Jane 70. Secker. And I'm Chris Morrison. And we co-chair the Alt Special Interest Group on Copyright and Online Learning. Yes, we do. And um, we have been doing this now for four years. We have been. More than four years. More than four years. So webinar number 70, what have we got lined up today? Well, we've got some copyright news. We have. Yeah. We have a fantastic uh, webinar that is being presented by three guests. Yep. So we've got Claire, Tanya and Emily joining us to talk about the work they did recently um, on open access monographs and third party copyright. So mm -hmm. we're looking forward to that. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to, without further ado, get through some things about what we've been up to since we last met. So, Chris, since yeah. we last went, met, what was all this? What's what was this? all this? Well, last week um, we got invited to talk at the Bodleian Library staff conference. We did. Um, which was, uh, as ever, I've been now to a couple of these since I've been there. Yeah. Oh, no, three. This yeah. was the third one. You've got uh, a lot of librarians. There are a lot of librarians, uh, who all of whom are very <laughs> Um, we were talking to them about uh, the ethical and legal implications of artificial intelligence in higher education. And we ran a new workshop. We did, we? yeah, yeah. So this is um, using the publishing trap characters. Um, we were able to kind of have a, quite a good workshop that followed on from there was as there seems to be artificial intelligence seems to be the theme of every single conference, doesn't it? It well, does. Every yeah. single everything yeah, yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So, you know. But it was lovely, Brilliant. St Anne's, St Anne's College. Ah, we have a comment from Rachel who was there. It was great Rachel. fun. Thank yeah, you, Rachel. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it was good to have you there. In fact, we had a scenario that was all about teaching intellectual property law, and then we had Rachel on that table. It was like, ah, good. That yes. wasn't planned, but that was very good. <laughs> um, okay, so that was what we did. Yeah. Um, we're now back here, um, and this is a reminder that we have an archive of the webinars um, uh, on our blog and on the YouTube uh, playlist, the alt YouTube. I'm not sure playlist. if we've got anyone here to put the links in the chat today. So okay. we'll, well have to do our I, I, utmost. I, I, I can, you can, I can do, do that. that. Yeah, I can yeah. do that. Yeah, I think can. everybody knows where this stuff is. So yeah. this one's okay. You okay. can probably leave. Oh, Catherine's here. She can like the link. Ah, oh, Sorry, okay. Catherine. We didn't actually send them to you today, though. Sorry, we have forgotten to do that. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Well, if if Catherine's on the on the link, add in then. Yep. Yeah. That will be excellent. So this is the archive where you can catch up on all the previous webinars. And now it is time for. Excellent. Copyright news. What, what have we got today? What have we got? Oh, 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 oh. oh you've gone too far. No, you right. clicked at the same time as me. I right, who's I driving? driving? I'm driving today. OK. OK. I, I will do the clicking. Um, and you can do that. Well, you introduce this one. OK, you find the link. OK, <laughs> unless Catherine can find the link to this one. So, OK, we are really excited because we're back in the podcasting mode, aren't we? We, are. we had quite zone. a few podcasts that were in um, that stored up in the copyright literacy. In team. the vaults. <laughs> Tin. <laughs> in, the, in the tin, in the tin, like a biscuit tin, is like it? A, yeah, it's a biscuit tin. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's a chocolate biscuit tin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right. Cool. Uh, anyway, we are really delighted because we have a editor working with us now, Emma mm -hmm. Gilbert, one of our fantastic learning technologists at City as well. Yes. Um, but she is um helping us out, and we've managed to release. Um, a podcast that we recorded in at the end of 2022, mm -hmm. which seems like forever, with Caris Craig, who is at Osgood Hall Law School, and she's a professor of intellectual property. And we had a great chat with her, and we also caught up with her more recently. Yeah. So if you haven't checked that one out, 
then do have a listen to that. She talks about loads of stuff to do with copyright mm -hmm. and Canadian law and critical legal studies and how we talked about how copyright impacts in high on higher education and also particularly on the library profession. So if you haven't heard it yet, I think you will enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and that's her dog Brody. That is her dog. Um, yeah, next yeah. up. Next up, right? Okay. So Karis has also um, been interviewed. Um, this came out just this week um, in Nature um, on uh, the story that some of you may have heard that's doing the rounds about Scarlett Johansson um, complaining that OpenAI have used her voice mm -hmm. um, without her permission. And um, there's an interesting piece. Um, that is written um, by um, a journalist who interviewed Keris Craig. Yeah. So that one's definitely worth having a look at. Um, I had a quick look at that this morning as well. So, yeah. AI is another, th it's all about AI at the moment. Obviously there is a conference uh, coming up um, hosted by a Swedish Library Association and Wikimedia in Sweden on copyright, text and data mining and AI on the 14th of June. Uh, so that one looks like a, a good one mm -hmm. to, to, to go along to, to and there, there's a lot uh, uh, in discussion about open culture and open practice and how that impacts uh, or how AI impacts on that. So. Um, looking forward to that one if you're we're really to testing it. Catherine's searching skills to find we, we, these we aren't are we indeed. we're just oh. seeing if she really is a, a a learning technologist and a librarian and has superpowers yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i've got the link here yeah ready we'll to go so i can in. put that one in yeah um, don't worry Catherine. <laughs> there we go. Okay. right uh, is this the final news story i think nearly nearly okay. i think there might be i think there might be a couple Oh, this was a, this was a, a item about the fact that the Association for Learning Technology mm -hmm. have opened their awards for 2024. Yes. And um, we wrote a blog post about this. Um, we were highly commended in an alt award last year for leadership in digital education. Yep. Um, and they asked us if we would promote the awards. So if you know somebody who makes a significant contribution in the digital education field, then do consider nominating them or nominating yourself because you are able to nominate yeah. yourself for an alt award. Um, and you can have a read of us bickering about each other in a little post blog post we wrote about it. And the point we were making there was to, to not necessarily think about a leader or leadership as one particular thing. Think about how it could be. I mean, in our case, it was expected in, in the past. It's been a single person and we thought, well, Mm. Actually, what we do is we do it together and there's a thing around co-leadership, uh, but there could be all sorts of unusual, um, not necessarily uh, well-established concepts of, of leadership that absolutely. you might want to think about. Yeah, so, absolutely. Not, not think outside the box. I was trying to avoid saying think outside the box. <laughs> Blue sky that was thinking. Blue sky, in the yeah, horizon yeah. earring, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so the final thing we've got here is that... Drum roll. Wearing our t-shirts. Ice pops, brookings are now open. Um, the Pocket Edition is taking place this year at Leeds Beckett University from the 5th to the 6th of September. Um, so two half days. Uh, and we're already seeing quite a lot of interest. We've had some bookings coming in. We've got some uh, brilliant presentations. I think you could almost say they're flooding in. They are flooding in. I, I, think, I think probably... The biggest concern I have is just how much excellent stuff people want to do and whether the pocket edition is going to be. It's going to be a bulging pocket, isn't it? <laughs> like when you put your keys and your change and your wallet and your phone all in the same pocket. It's going to be like some of those big pockets that you can have down the front of your dungaree. Oh, yeah, or, your or like, a, like an apron. Kind of, yeah, 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 it's that okay, kind of pocket. Yeah, so very exciting. But the call for papers, if you want to speak at it, closes on the 3rd of June, which is actually Monday at 5 p.m., so right. get your submissions in. We yeah. might possibly take a late one or two, but yeah. we really want them in um, so we can start putting the programme together. And uh, just a reminder about our keynote speaker. Who might that be? That would year? be the wonderful, fabulous, incredible Kyle K. Courtney Esquire, copyright advisor at Harvard University, longtime friend of Ice Pops and copyright literacy and just 
uh, superstar yeah. of the, the copyright and library world. So um, we are really looking forward to uh, him coming. Yeah. And uh, we're going to see whether, given that he is coming to the UK, we might be able to arrange some satellite type events and things that we can get him involved in. Yeah. Um, so uh, watch this space. Watch this space. The beginning of September will be, I don't know what we can call it, Courtney comes to UK. Yes. That's not a very snappy title. <laughs> it's UK tour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with all his sparkly jackets. With all, I think he's bringing the whole lot. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Trunk of them. Okay. Let's let's get this party let's on the road. On. Let's get the show on the road. So we are delighted to uh, have as our guests today uh, Claire Painter, Emily Hudson, and Tanya Aplin, um, who are the co-authors of this uh, guide that was published earlier this year, commissioned by UKRI um, into how to manage third party copyright material in open access publications with a focus on open access monographs. So um, Claire uh, is uh, from Claire Painter Associates. Uh, Emily Hudson is now professor at University of Oxford um, and uh, Tanya Applin, professor at King's College London. Um, so we've we've worked uh, in the past with uh, Emily, Tanya and Claire on various things they've presented at Ice Pops. They've done all manner of excellent stuff. Tanya was my supervisor when I was doing my master's at King's College London. Just a plug for that course. It's an excellent course. If you are considering on sharpening up your copyright skills, I would highly recommend the diploma. You don't necessarily have to go on and do the master's. Um, but yes, really pleased that they're here to join us. So I'd like to hand over to Tanya, Emily and Claire to talk us through this guide. Are you there? Can you hear us? Or can we hear you? <laughs> yes, and can you hear us? Yes, Yay! we can. Yay, fantastic. And, um, it, it's yeah. like you had some photographs of us and I looked at them and thought, how young we looked in those photographs. <laughs> it is still <gasps> us. Um, so I think what we're going to do, and am I coming through loud and clear? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we can hear you perfectly, Emily. Yeah. Great. I, I think I'm going to be um, leading the first part, which is most of our prepared remarks. But what we do want to do is leave plenty of time for questions, bearing in mind that many people on the call will have seen some version of this presentation before. So we'll sort of go over some of the key learning lessons from our work with UKRI, some of the key elements of the guidance, and then hopefully have a nice good question time to continue the discussion. Um, so I think a starting point is just to sort of give a bit of brief background as to the project and what we were asked to do. Um, so we were asked to help in particular with um, guidance in relation to third party copyright as it relates to the um, use of content in open access outputs and in particular long form outputs um, and to provide some guidance in relation to the exemptions in the uh, UKRI um, OA policy for uh, instances where permissions can't be obtained or suitable um, permissions can't be obtained for um, all the content that is proposed to be included in an output and the trade books exception. And just to emphasize that we did have a limited brief in terms of uh, our focus needing to be on, on those matters. We weren't asked to comment more broadly on um, open access policies generally. We do have some views on those, which um, we may well touch on in the course of, of today, but we did have um, um, a sort of quite focused brief. And furthermore, the output that was eventually released was not um, solely authored by us. Um, it is a UKRI output, which means there was what I've described here as an iterative process of review and revision. I think I came up with those words, Tanya and Claire, to describe the process that, um, that we went through. So what that means is there might be things we comment on today that weren't actually um, in the guidance. For instance, some of the nuts and bolts of how to do um, permissions clearance were, were things that um, UKRI sort of had views on how much detail it wanted to go into and so on and so forth. So there might be things that we can um, add to um, in, in terms of the questions today uh, over and above what's in the guidance um, itself. 
And as always, um, these remarks are our own um, and not um, anything to do um, with and we are not purporting to represent UKRI. Um, so we might just start with a brief overview of the OA policy, then um, a couple of the key learning points from the consultation that we did, and then um, uh, a bit of detail about what the guidance says. So um, I, on the slide, we've just provided an overview of the key points from the um, open access policy as it relates to long form outputs. I expect that many of you are familiar with this. It has now come into uh, force. Um, and uh, the key um, thing for uh, in-scope publications is that they have an OA requirement. Um, I think one thing that has been emphasised to us by UKRI, and I suppose we should re-emphasise to, to you, is that there is an option for either the final version of record or the accepted manuscript to be made available um, on an OA, um, on an online platform um, on, under an OA license within 12 months of publication. Um, so while we're going to talk about some of the challenges in um, uh, clearance of rights, um, as it relates to dealings with publishers, it's just important to bear in mind that the arrangement your researchers could come to is they make the author's accepted manuscript, the AAM, available on OA terms rather than the final version of record being published in OA format. Um, the requirement is that the OA version is published under a CC BY license, um, although any CC license will be um, uh, sufficient. Um, and just as an aside, there is a debate which we can um, comment on um, about a proposal that all long form outputs submitted for the REF um, be made available um, under an OA licensing requirement. So this would um, um, take this policy and perhaps in a revised form apply it to a much broader suite of outputs. Um, in terms of how third party content is dealt with under um, the UK RI OA policy, I think that the underlying rationale is that the open access version should not be some watered down, clearly second best version compared with the, uh, the published version or the version published under sort of ordinary uh, uh, traditional um, uh, terms. Um, and so OA versions should include, where possible, all the supporting content, the images, the illustrations, and so forth. However, there's also a recognition that it may not be possible for all that third party content to itself be subject to an open access license. So these licensing requirements do not apply to third party copyright content. And so just to be clear what that means is that if you can imagine what we might term the main work, um, that needs to be subject to an open access license, but there might be third party content within that, um, that um, main work that is made available, for instance, on the usual all rights reserved basis. And as we'll explain, this is perfectly possible as a matter of law. So long as the license you obtain from the third party rights holder says, you may make this content available in an OA publication. So that is you can have a situation where the license extends to allowing the content to be used in an OA publication, but not subject to that same OA license itself. So UKRI have tried to recognize uh, the challenges that will be involved in clearing rights and to, to, to in include content under an OA license as well. And so they've, they've tried to recognize that these licensing requirements don't apply to that third party content. Um, so we've got some um, recommendations, some guidance in relation to that rights clearance process. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, there's also though an exemption. Um, so this is an exemption to be very clear. This is an exemption to the OA licensing requirement. 
So to read it along together, it says that if um, reuse permissions for third party materials cannot be obtained and there is no suitable alternative option to enable open access publication, then the output does not need to be published in open access form. So to be very clear, this exemption relates to the entire work. Um, it's a self-applied exemption and is in a sense saying that if the third, if, if so much third party content had to be stripped away because permissions couldn't be obtained to include it in the OA output, then you don't have an open access um, uh, requirement, licensing requirement anymore. Um, in terms of just a couple of key lessons from the consultation and desk research. So one of the things we were asked to do as part of this project was to consult with publishers, to consult with representatives of universities and other research organizations in relation to their experiences, in relation to um, OA um, and copyright. Um, and indeed, some of you may have participated in focus groups that we ran um, uh, as we were uh, working on this project. Um, and just a couple of key learning points we, we got from that and associated desk research uh, as well. Um, first of all, um, and I think this will this, this slide should come as, as no surprise to, to most of you that um, the significance of monographs and long form outputs in certain academic disciplines compared with others. And so we really see when you crunch the numbers with REF um, um, uh, 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 data and, and from talking with people that monographs are much more significant in arts and humanities and social sciences than they are for medicine and science. And where this is particularly significant is that arts, humanities and social sciences are areas where rights clearance tends to be less straightforward, even for what we've termed traditional publications. Um, and uh, some of the reasons for that are um, indicated on the slide, um, that there's more likely to be third party material that cannot be substituted. Uh, so for instance, if you're writing an art history monograph and you're dealing with the works of Picasso, you need those works in the in the book. You can't just substitute with any old um, images. Um, also, those are sectors where it's more likely that you'll encounter rights holders who want to maintain high degrees of control over their IP and who charge higher licensing fees. Um, so uh, again, um, reports in relation to um, um, estates and visual arts collectives and so forth that may just have uh, more onerous conditions in relation to when they will provide a license for uh, images to be used in, in books and other outputs who often charge licensing fees. And I think one of the key points is that um, OA may serve to heighten those issues. So these are issues that already exist. And the question is whether open access makes those issues more significant, um, in particular because of a concern that OA increases availability, it increases the number of eyeballs that may be looking at an output, um, and um, whether or not that um, makes rights holders more concerned about unauthorized use of their content, whether it makes them um, inclined to charge higher fees. Um, and we also, from talking with um, uh, uh, people during the consultation, sort of try to get a sense of uh, the experiences of different stakeholder groups with copyright and open access. Um, and I think one of the key um, messages that we um, sought to include in our advice to UKRI was that obtaining copyright permissions is typically left to authors to arrange and to pay for. Um, and although broader questions about OA 
OA were not in scope for our project, we did want to include these observations to sort of give context to the guidance and also to make it clear as well that the guidance has multiple audiences. So we imagine that quite a few different groups, authors, publishers, universities, and indeed maybe rights holders themselves might look at the guidance. Um, our sense was, as indicated on the slide, that authors often have low levels of copyright literacy. Uh, I think that many of you will experience the person who just takes something off um, the internet because it's in the public domain um, and doesn't have the understanding of public domain as a, as a term of art or the 400 word rule, uh, various um, sort of ideas that uh, sort of permeate uh, through the researcher and author community that may or may not map onto what the law actually says. Um, also too, you'll find that people may have limited familiarity with Creative Commons. Um, but I think perhaps one of the biggest issues that we sort of see with researchers and authors is engaging with copyright late in the process. Um, and so I think one of the common refrains is authors need to consider copyright earlier and just thinking about ways, strategies, to encourage that uh, in a way that sort of doesn't just add yet another difficult burden um, to, to the research uh, process. Um, we spoke with publishers and um, saw that there are varying levels of support that they provide um, in relation to copyright clearance. Bearing in mind, as uh, uh, indicated earlier, it is typical for um, authors to be responsible for obtaining the permissions for their scholarly work and to the extent that some publishing houses do oversee this process it's often by editorial assistance rather than rights experts. Um, finally and sort of particularly relevantly for the uh, for the crew on board today um, was the role of universities and research organizations and I think one thing we were really trying to make clear that that came from the consultation that we did was that um, universities and research organizations provide higher level support, provide advice in relation to copyright, but they typically only actually actively involve themselves with rights clearance um, when it comes to doctoral theses. And that in actual fact, there is not an appetite to change this approach for various reasons, resourcing being one of them, um, but also about risk preferences that in actual fact, you can introduce complications and problems into a process. If you've got a university library providing advice on things like exceptions, when the, the publisher might have quite a, a different view in relation to the risks that it's prepared to take and ultimately it's the publisher um, who is um, the one who is taking the risk, the one who is publishing the work. And so I think that was another thing was just to be very clear about what universities are providing and the sort of a sense of, of what they wish to um, provide. Um, so then just a little bit now about the mechanics. And one thing to bear in mind, we were asked to focus on long form outputs but there is nothing special about long form outputs compared with articles. And indeed, the general process for clearing rights is the same um, in terms of the key stages as between what we might term traditional publications and OA outputs. And what changes though, is what you need to ask for. So in terms of, and we've got two key things as indicated on this slide. One is the rights that need to be requested to include the content in that open access output. So for traditional publications, one might have ideas such as a single territory, um, a time limited license that was um, connected to a particular print run, OA needs to have different and broader, uh, what well, needs to have broader uh, rights. So if we take seriously that OA publications are gonna have um, worldwide non-time limited availability, 
then the territory needs to be the world, there needs to be no time limit. Um, we need to see ideas like print run or maximum views removed from the license. So this is this is the aspect of the permission, which is to include the third party content in the publication itself. Then you also need to know how the third party content is to be presented. So is it being included on an all rights reserve basis or also subject to an open license? And just to, to clarify, this second aspect relates to what other users can do with the work. So bullet point one is your use of including it in the OA publication. Bullet point two is what downstream users may, may do. So for the main work, let's say you're using CC BY, downstream users may undertake acts with that output consistent with the CCC BY, a CC BY license. But let's say Claire's got a photograph in her monograph, which is uh, Tan Tanya's photograph, and Tanya has um, uh, licensed that on an all rights reserved basis. That means that downstream users who wished to perform an act with Claire's monograph would need to either remove Tanya's work or seek their own permission from her or use her content within the scope of a copyright exception um, in relation to their acts. So hopefully that makes sense, the difference in, in the um, application or the difference in the content of the license um, between OA and traditional publications, that for OA publications, you've got these two questions about do the rights extend to the OA environment and what may downstream users do with that, that content. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this broader license can potentially have implications for fees and willingness to um, grant a license. Um, this is on the basis that broader rights is typically seen by rights holders as meaning higher fees. And this is this can create a challenge because the traditional model does not really map well onto OA. Um, because the, the point of OA is not to suggest that everybody is going to be looking at the work, but everybody could. And that difference between is and could is quite um, significant. Um, as I mentioned, I think there can be concern amongst rights holders that OA works are more likely to be found, um, elements are more likely to be reused, um, and so concerns can be expressed then about, um, uh, about heightened um, infringing activity. Um, and um, so you might find that there are rights holders who just uh, uh, are much less comfortable with the OA environment because they perceive it um, as ceding too much control. Um, and one of the things we do in the guidance is we include some recommendations for how to negotiate with rights holders and indeed some sort of template um, uh, letters and paragraphs that you can use in, in those uh, dealings. Because we recognise, and this is a really key point, that OA needs rights holder buy-in to work. Um, so if you hit licensed uh, material, if you hit third party material, I should say, that you can't get a license for, what do you do? And, and, and this is the same as between traditional and, and OA publications. Um, remove it, um, substitute it. Um, for OA publications, there has been um, some discussion about tombstoning, which would mean that you might have a, uh, a published version, and an, if I can use that language, and an OA version where the OA version has black boxes or bits that come out, um, which do appear um, in, in, the, uh, 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 in the published version of, of the work. Um, I think this is perceived as quite unattractive because the OA user has like really in their face that they're not getting the full product, but it is a, it is a, a, an approach which um, is on the list of options. Uh, Link is also a, a possibility. So you instead of including a reproduction of of the work, uh, the image or what have you, a link to it. Just bearing in mind that as a practical matter, links can become broken, um, and indeed you need to make sure you're not linking to 
um, unauthorized content because that can still raise the possibility of, of copyright infringement. And um, I'm happy to explain that further uh, if required. Um, what about um, exceptions? What about uh, risk management? Um, the uh, main exceptions that might be relevant for scholarly publications are the quotation, criticism and review exceptions uh, in the UK copyright statute. Um, and our sense from our sort of dealings with publishers is that they have thought about these exceptions when it comes to images and illustrations and less so for what we term integrated quotes. So often in scholarly outputs, you'll have quotes woven into the main text. Um, and uh, my experience, and I think those of uh, Tanya and uh, uh, Claire and everyone we were speaking with was oftentimes until you have a really lengthy quote that kind of sits apart from the text, oftentimes publishers don't really think about where they needed to clear the rights for these for these quotes. And, and we think in most cases you don't need to clear rights because there would be an exception that would uh, apply. Um, um, does any of this change as we move from traditional publications to OA? Probably not a huge deal. Um, quotation, criticism and review are all fair dealing exceptions. That means that fairness is part of the test. Um, and it may be that there are slight differences in some instances in the fairness analysis between a traditional and an OA output, perhaps to do with the, the reach of the work. But I think most of the time, actually, the analysis will be uh, very similar. So uh, my sense is you don't have to undertake an entirely separate and different um, fair dealing analysis as between the OA and the traditional publication. I think there'll be a lot of synergy, but there may be some differences um, on the margins. I think though perhaps a, a bigger issue that, that you need to have regard to as part of a risk assessment is that OA outputs have worldwide distribution, but exceptions are territorial. So if um, you're thinking of relying on quotation exception, for instance, um, to bear in mind that there's a quotation exception here in the UK and many other countries have quotation exceptions, but as Tanya can tell us in uh, enormous amounts of impressive detail, those uh, quotation exceptions will take quite a different form. They might be quite, quite limited uh, compared with the UK uh, wording and indeed, a number of countries don't have one at all. So this is just part of one's risk assessment as to the degree to which you want to rely on um, exceptions um, in an OA context. Um, the other suggestion we make in the guidance and there is also a, a fair amount of uh, um, information about how you might do this is, is flagging that content for which you're relying on exception is outside the license over the main work. So why do this? Well, um, there is a risk of infringement by authorization. And so um, authorization infringement arises when you authorize somebody else to do an act, which is an infringement of copyright. And if I say to you, I'm going to give you a license to do a whole bunch of acts with this work, and in fact, that work contains third party content and you then infringe copyright by doing those acts. You're a primary infringer and I've authorised that infringement. Now, there is one legal response to this, which is that Creative Commons licences are applied as is. So if you have a look at the language of Creative Commons licences, they actually say that no warranties are made in relation to third party rights. So technically speaking, if I put a CC license on my work and put it out there and you rely you rely on that license and you do things and it turns out there was uncleared third party works in there, I could point to that provision of the CC license to say, well, I didn't warrant anything, so I'm not liable for infringed by authorization. It was all on you to double check everything. It's not an entirely attractive legal argument for a number of reasons, but even if you could use that clause of the CC license to avoid legal liability, 
I just think there is a, a, an importance in being transparent and clear about rights, that you make it clear to your downstream users what they may do, that this is part of being seen to play fair with rights, that, that we're trying to actually, the idea of OA is to facilitate downstream use, not to have it full of booby traps and surprises. So our suggestion is that if you've got content you're including under a copyright exception in an OA output, flag it, and probably the best way forward is just to say the license over the main work does not apply to this image. Or if you haven't got, if all images of the book uh, just are being included or all third party images are being included on an all rights reserved basis, it could be in the tombstone information in the front of the book, but just that you need to flag to users um, so that there's clarity about what your CC license covers. Um, in terms of when, in terms of the exemption, so recall the exemptions available. So this is the exemption from the OA licensing requirement. That's available when there's no suitable alternative option to enable open access publication. And I think one really crucial thing is that this exemption doesn't necessarily map happily onto the process of dealing with rights for um, long form outputs because often your researchers will contract first and they might have some bits of manuscript or a pitch they supply. So they get the contract, then they write or finish writing the, the work. And then at some stage after they've submitted the manuscript, that's when all the serious rights clearance starts. And the issue is that if at this stage, it turns out that clearing third party rights is going to be so difficult that you can't do OA, uh, an OA publication, then it might be quite difficult if you've contracted with a publisher to publish in OA form to then renegotiate and backtrack on everything. So our suggestion is that you really need to think about copyright early if you're going to contract with a publisher for an OA publication. Just to be clear about is it likely to have is this work likely to have many copyright issues? If there could be issues with some key material in the work, not being able to be used in OA form to think about that then. Um, we include in the guides some ideas about how to apply the exemption, bearing in mind it's self-applied. So you don't need to apply to UKRI. They're not going to go and, and uh, double check everybody's workings and, and reasoning. Um, final slide from me then, Claire might just say a, a few words before the Q&A, which is sort of this idea about the soft signals, like what's sort of underlying idea um, behind the sort of policy and just whether one of it is just to really start changing practices in the sector in relation to um, open access in particular and so changing attitudes, changing uh, practices. Um, and there's certainly things that researchers can do um, to um, uh, improve their ability to make things available in OA terms in terms of improving copyright literacy and thinking about copyright earlier and 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 so forth. But I think one of the things that sort of really came through our work was that if we really want OA to work, it can't just be all on researchers and authors. Um, and in fact, um, I think one of the key points um, um, is the need for right for rights holders to buy in, in in terms of issuing permissions for OA publications without adding really high license fees and and so on and so forth. But we can talk a bit further um, about that. Claire, do you want me to to turn over to you now just to say a few words about trade books exemption? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So uh, within the, the guidance, there is a, uh, within policy, there is an exemption for trade books where that is the only output from the, from the funded research. So if you have a, a number of things, then this wouldn't apply. But if the trade book is the only thing that's being produced, then you can have this, uh, you can make use of this exception. Um, what we found though, particularly in our research, is that actually if you, uh, if you were to ask the author of the work, do you think your work could have a wider audience? Would you like it to be sold through the trade? Invariably, they're going to say yes. And understandably enough, they want to find a wide audience wherever possible for their work. 
but that in itself isn't enough to really truly make it into a trade book and instead there's a number of criteria you would look at that really would come from the publishing point of view um, and in fact the publisher will usually have quite a clear view as to whether this is genuinely a, a trade book or purely a monograph and we've listed some of the, the factors here in the bullet points at the bottom of this slide so how how and to whom the title is going to be promoted and sold is it sold purely through academic markets or is it also sold through high street booksellers for example whether the book is purely academic in its content and presentation or actually geared towards that that wider reader um, production values can be relevant simply because trade books need to attract attention on the shelf and so you can have perhaps a more glitzy cover or something like that something to make it stand out in a way that academic books uh, do in a different way um, the number and quality of any images, although I would slightly caveat that because it does depend completely on the subject area. Obviously, books that there are academic books that rely very heavily on on illustration. But if uh, more illustrations have been added in order to give it that wider audience, that might might veer it towards the trade end of the spectrum. And finally, the pricing, the format, and the distribution channels. Is it is it being sold uh, through those trade channels or not? Um, I wouldn't, uh, one of the questions we had as we were going through this is, oh, well, my book's being sold on Amazon, so therefore it must be trade. I personally, I wouldn't, uh, this is just a personal view, but I wouldn't take that alone as being an indication of a trade book because pretty much all books that are published are going to be available on Amazon. That doesn't necessarily mean it's being marketed through those trade channels. Uh, can we move? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Moved on to the next slide. Um, so this exemption is self applied. But it does, as I say, it shouldn't really be the author deciding this on their own. It should be in conjunction with their publisher to determine whether that's that's a, a fair assessment for this particular book. Um, and UKRI, as, as we say, they have chosen to take a flexible approach. They wanted to make this, uh, to put this in the, the, the scope of the people working on the book rather than UKRI having to come in and try to adjudicate, which wouldn't really um, make very much sense. Uh, but at the same time, they do expect a fair and balanced view to be taken so that it isn't just a way of avoiding open access because perhaps clearing permissions is getting a bit complicated or a bit expensive and therefore you think oh well let's call it a trade book and we can uh, we can avoid some of that some of those problems in that way it has to be approached in a in a, in a balanced in a balanced manner uh, and then we wanted to move on to q a emily do you want to do you want to yeah, pick up I, I think we've just we sort of had a number of things we could conceivably talk about depending on the interest of those in the room and you know, very happy whether it's the legal weeds with anything we've talked about, um, mechanics of licensing or um, other stuff. So that's that's us for our prepared bit. Thank you very much, Emily, Claire, Tanya. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was fantastic. And I think uh, just to reiterate um, that the the guidance um, that you've put together, I think, is is an excellent piece of work. It's something that is really helped me certainly in um, responding to the kind of questions that we get because then we can say well here's the expert advice mm. uh, I think we're, we're very much aware and I think you've touched on this that um, this is not a perfect optimized environment there's a huge amount of compromises a huge amount of pressures uh, coming from different directions and the researchers are to a certain extent yeah, they, they're stuck in the middle they clearly mm. want to just do the right thing can somebody please just tell me what i need to do to get jump through the administrative hoops to get my publication out there in this new environment and, and they're going to those different uh, people the different organizations their their research institution that employs them the publisher that's um you know the publishing uh, and they're all hearing a slightly different story from them um i wonder whether uh, i mean the guidance it does, helps because it provides templates and it provides guidance on you know where they might go but again there are numerous options they could take there's the exemption there's the the getting the clearance there's paying for things um I mean, is there something systemic that you feel would really help you know some kind of solution that would help this situation is it a change in the, the funding policy a, a change in copyright law around make clarity around whether fair dealing could absolutely apply to this what what are your thoughts on the most helpful way through where we are at the moment it's a really good question 
I have a sense. Uh, Chris, my immediate response, I'd be interested to hear Tanya and Claire's, is money. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not too sure it's a good response, but I'll tell you why it's the response I have. It's because all this stuff requires resources. Mm. And particularly if if UKRI, if there's if if we're all serious of changing the rules in relation to the to to the ref um coming up so that long form outputs in the ref have OA, then universities are going to need, need to be finding money to pay for um OA publications um in a in much sort of much more widespread way than than they're doing now. So I suppose part of me says that you need resources. But then I think the concern I have with my answer there is that is this just this big circle of money that goes round and around and around and it's not actually a good use of resources at all? Um, for instance, do we really want a world where students pay fees to universities to pay academics incomes to then pay for third party rights to go to museums to digitise stuff in the public domain to then help? the collections of music like it just it just at some stage you say like are we just paying for security and certainty when we don't need to and we should all just be in exceptions land so part of me feels actually we should be more in exceptions land and i'm not too sure how much you can clarify copyright law to improve the situation as opposed to just doing stuff and not being sued um, I think, you know, Tanya and, and Lionel have written a fantastic book about quotation and really called for a very forward leaning approach to quotation. And so part of me says money and part of me says the quotation exception. Thanks, Emily. Tanya, I'd be fascinated to hear your take on it, thinking about in your work on global mandatory fair use. Is there something that could happen at that level? What, what are your views on moving towards exception land? I mean, I, I very much agree with what Emily has said, I think in terms of moving towards exceptions land, it requires certain key institutional players to embrace risk, right? And and yeah. deal with a scenario whereby that risk is borne out by litigation. So mm -hmm. um, that's what's required in, in my view. And, um, you know, to have someone that's going to be kind of bolder in embracing the risk and say, OK, well, if this happens, we'll we'll sort of stand stand by it. One of the things that we encountered in the consultation is that some of the purely OA publishers were a little more risk embracing of relying on copyright exceptions. And yet they were the publishers that had the most to lose if they were going to be sued. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whereas publishers who are, you know, in a better position to um, respond to possible litigation um, were being sort of far more cautious. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's a key difficulty. I also wanted to just pick up on this point about, you know, what if this policy is extended to ref outputs? And I think, you know, I think it's potentially very problematic without seeing how the UKRI policy plays out. I mean, when you look at the proposal for the REF OA policy for long form publications, there's first of all differences in approach. So, you know, the OA version has to be available 24 months after publication instead of 12 months. The date of eligibility is different. Um, uh, it's not entirely clear whether the exemption would be self-applied for REF or not. And I just, I think, I think we should be very hesitant to be kind of embracing this um, for REF 2029, even though that's a long way away, without knowing how this kind of plays through. Because as Emily said, you know, the pressure that will be created is resource to have funded OA publications that are long form and that's going to mean academics competing for for that um, or mm. else it mean institutions have to gear up to have proper systems to allow institutional repositories of the version of record or author's accepted manuscript version and i think that could be massive but then, then that burden and the risk is very much on the institution if they're saying we're not funding we're not we're not providing too much funding for um 
funded OA outputs, instead we'll just opt for the, the kind of institutional repository version. Yeah, absolutely. The, the really important questions. And, and I'm just thinking about all the sort of transaction costs that come with doing doing all those transactions, but then changing the system. Yeah, um, I've seen that the question. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions come up in yeah. the chat, haven't we? Um, and I think the first one from um, Lisa was, um, and I think po possibly maybe aimed at Claire, but I don't know which one of you wants best to answer this. Do you know if academic publishers are gearing up to handle um, the, the copyright issues? Yeah, shall I take that one? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so they are they are to some extent. Um, uh, publishers take a take a, there are publishers who take different views about this as Tanya was saying the ones who are purely open access publishers have often been the most uh, the most innovative or the most um, mm. uh, sort of strongest if you like in their in embracing um, the use of exceptions um, some of the, for some of the bigger publishers it's it's much more a matter of this is our policy and you the researcher need to follow it now the ones that I've seen who are following best practice I would say are the ones that actually provide more than that for the researchers so there'll actually be a person that the researcher can engage with and say well I mean, this is my specific situation how do I manage this um, that's very time consuming it's one-on-one -on -one and it involves everything from the very um, uh, the, the very specific um, the, the very technical if you like sort of looking particularly at whether it, could this be fair dealing for criticism or review or quotation or something else all the way through to researchers who actually haven't got very much copyright experience and have heard of something called fair use and assume it applies all over the world so yeah. dealing with, with the, that whole range of experience so from the publisher's point of view that's quite a lot of time and resource to invest not as much as what Tanya was suggesting of actually taking taking more risks and then letting it go to litigation if that's the way that it goes but ultimately that's the way that would give us maybe some more clarity about it um, yeah. I think particularly in terms of use of images where the the default position from publishers tends to be that images need to be cleared unless we're sure that they don't um, whereas with text quotations, there's more of a tendency to say, well, perhaps this can come under criticism and review and, and perhaps we could use it in that way. And it's, it's mm. much less of a, it's, it's a lower risk. But with images, they do tend to um, go for the more risk averse approach. Thanks, Claire. That's really good uh, to hear. And I think just one comment to say, not all publishers are the same. Um, and there are many different types of publisher and Absolutely. increasingly university presses opening up open access presses which is clearly going to it adds extra spice into the mix yeah um, uh, we've got Dan uh, has got his hand up Dan did you want to come on the mic and ask a question sure thanks Chris um, so my question was about the um, the works which have an overall license and then the figures within might have a more restrictive license <clears throat> now we you talked about how that's compliant and I agree that is compliant with the policy but I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how open access we can regard a publication to be when there's so much onus on the user to to be aware they have to look for alternative licenses understand the implications of that and have the technological wherewithal to then remove those licenses before they can actually use that that work as with that open license uh, and i think we can almost take that as a comment rather than a, a question because you've nailed the issue bear in mind that this is inbuilt into the creative commons system so Creative Commons licenses are as is. And I think that they were originally rolled out with some, probably in a quite different context of sort of individual creators wanting to do mashups and whatnots with other people's works. And so that sort of, um, um, sort of a creative activity, but now we see Creative Commons really is the the licensing mechanism of choice um, amongst um, government bodies and public sector bodies and and so forth but what you've said is absolutely correct that um, when you've got a work which is third party content heavy it does mean that the user has to in theory at least check everything and if they're going to reuse it remove content relicense it and so on and so forth and that might be a reason why some rights holders feel 
concerned about OA publications because they realize that a lot of users won't have the legal knowledge to realize they need to do that. So one of the reasons for being really clear with flagging in the book, the different um, license arrangements. So perhaps images have as part of the caption, not just a copyright notice, but is it is there a CC license covering that image? Is it all rights reserved and so forth might well be. And we need to see how things go in terms of rights holder responses and some will be more concerned than others. And over time, fewer may be concerned, but just to give comfort that the downstream user knows what to do with that content. But your, your point is entirely well made. And this is one of the whole issues with this process um, or, or with, with OA is that you might have quite complex works in terms of the right situation. That's it. Another thing too I would just add though, is I think we're sometimes I do wonder whether for some of the outputs that get caught by this policy, whether CC by is quite a broad license to have for a monograph um, in the arts and humanities and actually whether or not if we're really interested in access, whether CC by NCND gets you a huge way along in terms of access. Because it may be that people can't do commercial use and they can't make derivative works, but it may well be that for a lot of long form monographs, actually what you want is people to be able to read the work. And if they want to do commercial stuff, make derivative works and so forth, we may say, well, it's appropriate that they get a license at that point. So for the purpose, yeah. so when we're just dealing with a more restricted, restricted copyright, um, a, a more restricted Creative Commons license, it might be that some of those concerns about how will users understand the complexity of rights can sort of um, recede to, to a degree. Yeah, thank you. Excellent point. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things we, we we see here in this space is that there are so many different options. If you if you give researchers all the options of the different types of Creative Commons license, as well as the options of the, the 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 exemptions and the exceptions, and all it, it, it's overwhelming to them. So maybe it is, it is yeah. something to actually, if we do have conventions of how we deal with this, to to make it you know, fewer options sometimes is easier. It's like going to Aldi, isn't it? You just pick the one off the shelf rather than being given all. But I think the thing is that the message that's come very strongly from the sort of open movement and Creative Commons mm -hmm. is that. CCBY is, is the license is to open and yeah. anything else is not open. No, yeah, yeah and I think that is problematic when you talk to researchers who yeah. sort of say, well, hang on, I don't know, I do want someone doing something commercial with it or, yeah, making a derivative work. We've reached the end of our time. We've, we have, we are, our, yeah, our... we are overrunning and we're just aware quite a few people are um, leaving. I think we're going to be finishing by 12.40, so if you can stay around um, just for another five minutes, just so we can check we've got any final questions. Um, yeah. But um, and maybe just check if there's any final comments from Emily, Tanya and Claire. Yeah. I know we didn't even get into THJ versus Sheridan and really get into the thing around public domain and digitizations, which I think is a big part of the mix of this. So we may have to return to that. But um, Emily, Tanya, Claire, do you just want to make some final remarks? I had one thing just very quickly. I think you mentioned CC BY. I think in terms of clearing permissions, CC BY is clearly the one that's going to concern rights holders the most because it allows the most, uh, the most downstream, allows the most, uh, the most downstream types of use. And um, what we did at the uh, in the very last section of the guidance, there's there's a set of of, of different points which we designed in order to um, uh, things that that you could actually use when you're talking to a rights holder to explain to them because very often what you'll find is the rights holders are actually not that familiar with open access. They're kind of a bit scared by it. They don't really know what it means, why it's been raised, and why they're getting this slightly strange looking permission request. So I would hope that some of those sections would be really helpful as in things that you could actually just use in as a sort of neutral, if you like, an outside view of what this is all about and and, and why it's not quite as scary to grant permission for this kind of use as they might initially assume. Yeah, thanks very much, Claire. And just to, to reiterate again, it's a really useful and helpful guide. And however complicated this situation is, having something like this on hand is is really useful. So thanks. Emily Tanya? Just very quickly to say, for those of you who can feed into the 
ref um, OA consultation, please, please do. I mean, I know at my own institution, there hasn't really been a lot of sort of consultation within. And the worry is that the policy just gets propagated without a sort of full um, stakeholder engagement. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Tanya. Emily. Um, so THJ Systems in Sheridan, my take home was it doesn't change anything in relation to the law. To the extent that the trial judge was using skill and judgment as the test, that's been wrong for uh, ever since 2008. Um, and good old uh, Richard Arnold just told us what the law already is um, and um, did a great job in doing so. Um, but obviously it has received a lot of traction and very happy to talk about that case and originality and public domain images in future. Oh, that sounds like a there topic for a future <laughs> webinar, doesn't it? Yes, that would be fantastic, Emily. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it just remains for us to, to thank the three of you um, for a fantastic piece of work and for agreeing to speak to us and for Emily hopefully agreeing to come back and speak to us again. Um, on which note, we have our future webinar slide, so we're definitely going to pencil something on DHJ versus Sheridan. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, we'll be talking to you maybe about some time in the autumn, if mm -hmm. you'll be happy, um, Emily, or maybe you could come to Ice Pops and talk about it there. Mm -hmm. Not another plug. Another yeah, plug. Yeah. Ice Pops. Yep. Yeah. Call <laughs> contributions still open. Uh, we have the next one coming up. We're, we're not doing one in June. That right i think we couldn't find a date could we no we can't we're very we're busy. So busy lots going on yeah. um so july the 19th of july we are having an introduction to lacquer the libraries and archives copyright alliance with the co-chairs matt lambert and christy henshaw um so matt and christy are going to talk to us share what what lacquer gets up to um and how you can get involved yeah and we've got a couple of other topics that we're lining up as well yeah. so um in addition to um the one we've just discussed. Um, we will be presenting um, next month um, some of our findings from our copyright anxiety research at the uh, Canadian um, Copyright Conference, the ABC Conference, and we thought that we would do a webinar based on that presentation we, for we everyone. Well. Just, Fascinating stuff that we're finding. Because so. why should the Canadians just get to hear all about it? So we're gonna we're gonna run a webinar about that. So watch this space, and um, we're also we we've always got controlled digital lending on the mind, haven't we? We have. It's yeah. it's there. It's, it's there. A thing. Um, Maybe right. we'll be talking about that. And so the final one last thing, just to let you know, this is something that you were involved in. Uh, yes. Podcast. We love podcasts about information literacy this we do is. we do um so this one yeah chris has just put in the link into the chat um in addition to jane being 50 information literacy is 50 this year so the most amazing things all created in 1974 um no this podcast is actually i am i do feature in it but it's mm. got lots of other people who are kind of experts in information literacy reminiscing talking about how um the term has changed and how their work has changed in this field and yeah it's just I, I think it's great I'm really excited that this came out just a few days ago so if you're looking for something to listen to over the weekend there you go Brilliant. one last thing okay thanks so much everyone for coming and thanks again to Emily Tanya and Claire for joining us yeah thank you ever so much and we will